sharing who they are without fear and without reserve. And so, um, please stand up to talk. He's at peace with the books and talk in front of lots of people, but he always asks for the spirit to lead him. So, while we go to my last pray that you show him grace and welcome him in your hearts. We just be thankful that he would take the room from God this tonight. Amen. Amen. Our hearts are all ready after that worship, eh? Amen. Come on up and I'll pray for you, buddy. Patrick Ryan. Today my name officially changed to many ways. Um, I have no clue what I'm going to say. I don't have no clue what I said to Pat in the coffee shop. My disclaimer is I have full blown attention deficit disorder. So if a, screw, if a squirrel walks by, I, I, I'm in trouble. But I also have autism. And you wouldn't know it. The world causes it. Causes, cause, calls it a disability. I call it a gift. I'm going to spend about 20 to 30 minutes here, the most hopefully, and put a mic in front of me and I can go all night. If you get nothing out of this, you get this. Jesus Christ said to Esther, for such a time as this, and Esther said, what, I have to talk to the king? And Jesus said to Esther, what if everything that's happened to you up until this point was for this place and time? The good stuff, the bad stuff, the bad decisions, the good decisions. So my question or my challenge to you tonight will be is what if your life is for such a time as this? I've spent 35 years in front of people. I've spent many years in addiction. I was a professional athlete. Tonight I'm going to talk to you a little bit, I'm going to call an audible, I'm in the football world, so I'm going to call an audible tonight, I'm going to do something that I have never done in 30 years of speaking, and I'm going to tell a story backwards. So forgive me if I lose track a little bit, but I'm going to share my story, I'm going to intertwine my story in with this. But I'm going to talk about butterflies, I'm going to talk about bears, and I'm going to talk about bold requests. Because at the end of this, I'm going to give you a request. But I want you to think of your life is for such time as this. First of all, let's talk a little bit about butterflies. I think all of us in here uh, have heard of the butterfly effect. We heard of that? Maybe, maybe not. Okay. To give you a little bit of um, background on what the butterfly effect is, I grew up on a farm in Michigan. I'm a little farm boy. I can't spell hardly. I've written 47 books and six bestsellers. And I was told that I would never, never mind anything, and my words would never matter. My father's got a seventh grade education, can't write his own name. They've been married 67 years, and it's a wonderful story. But I grew up thinking that I was just nothing. But I had one thing, I caught butterflies. And there's this old, I don't know, is there any scientific people in here that you like, the kind of geeky thing? Okay. Well, there's this, there's this, Thing that's been around for years about this butterfly effect that says if a butterfly flaps its wings in Denver, Colorado, somewhere in Asia, all that momentum will create a hurricane. Well, that was a fable. But in 1963, scientists proved that to be true on a molecular standpoint. Well, the interesting thing is that's a Godly principle. Because everything matters. Everything you have done to this point in time matters to God, to somebody else. There are generations that now haven't even been born yet that what you do will affect them. And the old story about the butterfly effect is that, I'll give you an example, is that growing up on the farm, we had to deal with corn. And I, I don't know if you guys know about one kernel of corn, that thing, I mean, it's like rabbits. I mean, this thing will just produce corn and corn, and just bushels full of corn, one kernel. 
And it was this guy named Norman Borloff that got the Nobel Prize or something for creating hybridizing corn. And he was supposed to have saved two billion people in the world. Well, I had to do a study on Norman Borloff when I was growing up about corn. Well, the thing is, is that I got the reading. Maybe it wasn't Norman Borloff at all that changed two billion people. Maybe it was Henry Wallace. Henry Wallace was the vice president under Joe Roosevelt, who was the agriculture guy. And he hired Norman Borloff. So maybe it was Henry Wallace that should get the award for saving two billion people. Not Norman Borloff. Well, the story goes that maybe it wasn't Henry Wallace at all. Maybe it was George Washington Carver. George Washington Carver was basically a, a, a babysitter for Henry Wallace 40 years before. and taught him about plants. And there's like 70 or 80 inventions with peanuts and potatoes. So maybe it was George Washington Carver that should get the award for saving two billion. Maybe it was a farmer in Kansas. Moses, Susan, I think their name was. And it was back in the slavery days. And they were against slavery. And he had the KKK and they had all this. And they had a friend. Susan had a friend, can't remember her name. They had a child named George. And the raid that the KKK people came in and they raided the place. They went and they were getting ready to kill the lady that had the child named George. And the story goes where George Washington, or I'm sorry, Moses, traded his only horse for that baby boy. And they promised God that they would raise that baby boy and they would name him George Washington Carver. Maybe it was George Washington Carver that saved those two billion people. It was life matters. A friend of mine sent me an article about a month ago and says, you can read this story about this best-selling Christian author. It's in the top 50 of the Christian authors of the world. I got to get a little research. And I found it kind of odd that five years before he got awarded best selling author and he was living in his Jeep. He had lost his faith at four dollars and fifty one cents to his name. He had made millions of dollars. He was an athlete, a professional athlete, twenty years old. He had written a bunch of books. He got addicted to steroids. One day he watched his cousin die on his deathbed. It wasn't going to happen to him. And one thing led to another, and his focus had changed, and he found himself in the hills of Colorado, ironically, in a Jeep. Not as his career began, but as his career halfway through and he lost sight of God. And I found that kind of interesting that his best-selling author who had written all these books was now living in Jesus and nervous. And then I went on to read a little bit more of the story and found out that this guy ran into a brown bear in Aspen, Colorado. He went out the wrong door of his chalet and he thought he was going to Starbucks coffee shop. And he went out the back door instead of the front door. He accidentally turned the corner. And when he walked out the door, he saw a cop car here and a cop car here and a brown bear standing here. And the brown bear looked him in the eyes and went down on all fours and he walked out of the city. And the man went to the Starbucks coffee shop and he had to tell somebody the story. Gets in line in the Starbucks and he starts talking to this guy. And this guy's six foot five and he's dark and he goes and points his finger and he says, this guy's chest and he goes, 
I don't know what's going on in your life, mister, but somebody's got your back. See, in the world of the culture of Indians, every animal has a symbol. In the mountains of Colorado, living in a Jeep, Jesus Christ sends a bear to be interpreted by a bear and an Indian and says, somebody's got your back. And I thought that was interesting how Jesus Christ brings signs. People, animals, addictions, whatever it is. And I've read on a little bit more about this wonderful story. And I read about him living in Louisville, Kentucky. He was dating a woman that was a nurse. They had a wonderful relationship, and he had lost his way. She was an unbeliever, and he was a believer. And in 10 months, his house burned down. Two of his friends committed suicide. His father got arrested at eight years old. He got diagnosed with a few diseases. And everything that could go wrong did in 10 months. But all he could do was bring his girlfriend to a, to a Bible study group. And one day they went running with another friend. And she came back home and she was smiling from ear to ear. She says, guess what? And the guy said, what? He said, I just accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. And I said, he said, let me get this straight. In a Starbucks coffee shop, you got down on your knees and you accepted Jesus Christ in front of me. And the story goes on, that was the most powerful thing that that man had seen in the entire life. And Jesus Christ said it wouldn't get any easier. We know that when we accept Christ, it doesn't always get any easier. And four months later, he woke up one morning and she had a gun pulled to his head. She had turned into an oxycontin painkiller junkie. And for the first time in his life, the man had no words. And God says to him, it's not what you write, it's what you believe about what you write. She put the gun down, picked up the phone. He called the police. He never saw her again and pushed him to Colorado to run into a bear. To be interpreted by an Indian to live in Jeep. I found that quite interesting. How God takes one bad thing and he goes, I got a plan for you. It doesn't get any easier, but he's got multiple things going on in our lives. So maybe it was the nurse who was the best selling author. Maybe it was the bear. Or maybe it was the guy that that guy met 12 years or 20 years before. And he accidentally turned the corner in a health club. And the guy put his hand on his back and he said, Would you like to work out with me? And two years later, that boy was on the cover of every magazine there was. Maybe it was that friend that put his hand on his back and said, I got your back. Maybe he's the best selling author. Or maybe it was the adopted mother that wrote boy all the letters of love and kindness and unconditional love that gave him some leadership and plopped the seed down that he did the words pattern. Maybe she's the best selling author. Or just maybe it was 12 years before on the steps of an abortion clinic. When a grandmother of this best-selling author intercepts the biological mother on the steps of an abortion clinic and talks the biological mother out of aborting the boy and adopted him at five days old to her sister for 18 years to have a child 20 minutes away. Maybe the grandmother was the best selling author. My name is
was Greg Peck and Ron. And 40 years ago, on the steps of abortion clinic, God showed up in places that you couldn't imagine. And he took a little boy, and he gave him to a mother who had been praying for 18 years. God, give me a son. And that boy grew up thinking he didn't matter. He gets introduced to an exercise program from a guy that puts his hand on his back and says, you matter. Oh, I wanted somebody to believe in me. And he started putting a needle in himself. He wanted to fit in. And he would do anything that was possible to fit in. All he wanted was acceptance, identity, purpose. There was a locker room that everyone in this room has. We all want to fit in. And I took a needle and I watched my cousin die at 109 pounds. And it wasn't going to happen to me. And four weeks later, I rolled my car over nine times. And I walked away. I have escaped death four times in my life. And when that gun happened, 14 years later, the woman that I loved, God had a different plan. What if? What if 49 years ago in the steps of abortion clinic, God wanted me to meet him at the Starbucks to share a story about how God showed up in the steps of abortion clinic for a Starbucks. When that gun happened to me, it pushed me into Colorado. Lord, I can't do this anymore on my own. I'm searching for my path. And he says, let go of the oar. What's the easiest way to turn a canoe when you're rolling up the, rolling up the stream? He says, let go of the oar. The boat takes care of itself the stream. That's the last thing I want to do. And he says, how's that work? I made millions by the time I was 20 years old. This is the first time I've said this in public. God said to me, about the time I met Pat, this is your best story yet. I don't want to tell this story, Lord, of how I lost millions of dollars. And I got $4.51 to my name, and I'm in the hills of Colorado in a Jeep. And he says, it's your best story yet. Because somebody needs to hear it. Just let go of the oar. And the day that I did that, 12 hours later, my life changed. My book sales tripled. I've got agreements and NFL teams and things on the verge that I could never. I have a company now in eight different countries. Because I let go of the oar. For such a time as this. Jesus says, well, I've met the steps of the abortion clinic. What if you being diagnosed with autism? What if that you could never pass a test in growing up and you thought you were stupid? You had attention deficit disorder. But then you tested Mensa and you were a genius. What if that needle that went in you, that you can talk to somebody but your cousin can't? What if the gun? What if? We make bad decisions. But what if it was for this such a time as this that Jesus Christ says, it's Esther? The first thing we want to say is, I'm not worthy. I've done all this stuff in the past. I'm not worthy. And he says, I died for you. I've taken all this away. I don't care what you guys think. I grew up more worried about everybody 
that's good. It's not my responsibility how I can be nervous. It's my obligation to tell them my life depends on it. And it might be my own. It's your story. It's the butterfly effect. Of a woman stepped in a Porsche cart that flapped her wings 49 years later and 6 million words in print. A little boy that was told he never loved him. But Jesus Christ, Christ says you matter. You matter. Jim? Is it Jim? Jeff. John. <clears throat> you always follow your nudges. Nudges are always right back, right? It was a feather, my friends. And it was Susan in my cheek. I had feathers in all my books. A feather doesn't know where it's going to go. It has no baggage. It rides on the wind. It doesn't know how long it's going to stay, but you know what it has? It has hope. All I did was do. Wow. Because you know when the first one came up from the the story of death. Hope and death. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> when we feel a nudge, we do it. I'm going to close with this. I want to close with this. God showed up. He always does. Fifteen years ago, I jumped out of an airplane. And my friend Kathy with bone cancer. What did I have to lose? And we jumped. Pumped up Kentucky. There was no hearts, no car, there was no Starbucks. A hundred-year-old airplane, and I trusted the man strapped to my back. But I did it for Kathy. And we jumped out of there, went 150 miles an hour. Probably wet my pants, I don't know. And I look over Kathy and she's smiling from ear to ear. And I went, oh my God, hope floats. And that was the book with one of my first best selling books, Hope Floats, and that probably helped 100,000 women with breast cancer. And we got down on the ground and I had to help her and I said, can I ask you a question? Why did I feel more at peace when I jumped than I did in that airplane? died four months later. And here's what she said to me. It's all about the leap. Why do we feel more peace when we leap? Then we're sitting with fear and doubt. I'm 150 miles an hour. I'm 10,000 feet from the ground. I got a dude on my back. I don't even know. He's going to pull the cord. Tell your story. Like a life depends on it. My name is Greg.